Okay, uh, well, good afternoon, everyone, and uh, welcome to the Tackling Global Challenges series uh, by the Tomcat Center for Sustainable Energy. My name is Matt Cannon. I'm the director of the Tomcat Center, and I'm really excited to host this event today on behalf of the entire Tomcat team, uh, myself, Donica, Brian, and Elizabeth. Um, I'm really honored uh, to host the, uh, our, our guest today, and I will uh, introduce her very shortly. Uh, but I first just want to take a minute to, uh, to describe the Tackling Global Challenges series, if this is your first time uh, joining this event, or, or, or just refresh your memory on uh, what we are, are trying to accomplish here. So um, this series is really about uh, highlighting particular problem areas uh, in energy and sustainability, and then engaging people from outside of Stanford uh, to provide deeper insights into these problems and uh, tell us what they are doing to address them and then give us some perspective on uh, opportunities for additional ways to, to solve these problems. So this is our, our second episode uh, on the problem area of tropical deforestation. Uh, for those of you who were with us uh, in the fall for the first episode, we, we heard from two uh, forest conservationists and forest researchers who have spent uh, decades in tropical forests uh, trying to understand the root causes of deforestation and devise different ways of, of addressing those causes. Uh, so we were joined by Dan Nepstad and Matt Leggett. And one of the key takeaways um, from their presentations and their dialogue was uh, that more than 70% of deforestation in the tropics uh, is driven by the conversion of forests into new agricultural land. Okay, And the, the, the three biggest culprits are pasture land for beef, um, and then farmland for soybeans and palm oil. So uh, today, this episode is really focused on trying to come up with a solution to this problem from the supply side. So ultimately trying to change uh, how we make food. Uh, and so with, with that backdrop, uh, it's really my pleasure to uh, introduce Lisa Dyson, who is the uh, founder and CEO of Air Protein. Uh, so as, as a brief uh, background to Lisa, uh, she's a, a physicist by training. So she did her undergraduate degree at Brandeis in physics and mathematics. She was a Fulbright scholar at Imperial College um, and then did her PhD in theoretical physics um, and string theory in particular uh, at MIT. And so after graduating, uh, she, she came to the Bay Area for postdoctoral research. She did some work at North Berkeley uh, and as well as here at, at Stanford. Um, and I think uh, during this time or, or, or perhaps before, she became uh, increasingly interested in climate change and in sustainability. Uh, and eventually decided that the, the best way for her to try to address these problems uh, was to become an entrepreneur and uh, develop new technology. Uh, so she, she worked for a couple of years with the Boston Consulting Group. She got exposed to a, a, a number of, of industries. Uh, and then in 2008, she co-founded uh, Coverti. Uh, and this is a company uh, to develop really a platform technology for using microbes uh, to take carbon dioxide and uh, simple inorganic inputs like hydrogen uh, and generate a variety of products, including plastics uh, and animal feed uh, and other food products. Um, she remains the uh, executive chairman of Coverti, uh, but in 2019, uh, she spun off Air Protein and became the CEO of Air Protein. And Air Protein is really focused on making uh, the world's most sustainable meat. Uh, so, so making meat products using this core microbial technology. Um, Air Protein has gotten a tremendous amount of uh, momentum in the last uh, couple of years. 
uh, and actually I think more broadly, this entire space of uh, alternative meats and proteins um, is really a, at a tremendously uh, exciting point in its trajectory. Uh, so today, Lisa is going to give us a, a an, an overview of of air protein uh, and kind of set the stage, uh, and then we're going to have a uh, an extended discussion uh, with uh, I, I hope uh, a lot of input from our audience. So um, at at any point uh, along the way here, if you would like to um, ask a question or propose a question. Uh, please submit those questions through the, the Q&A function on the Zoom, uh, and, and I will do my best uh, to accommodate those questions in the, in the uh, course of the next uh, 45 minutes or so, um, it, it, as long as they're, they're not on string theory or something like that. Um, so uh, it's really my, my pleasure, uh, Lisa, to, to welcome you today, and uh, we're really excited to hear more about uh, air protein and about uh, your story. So uh, thank you. Wonderful, thanks so much for having me. And I would say it's nice to be back at Stanford, you know, but it's virtual. <laughs> um, yeah, it's been a couple years there and, and happy to talk about, you know, deforestation, climate change and these things and how we can create solutions for tomorrow. Uh, and so I'll talk about what we're doing at air protein and, and I'll kick it off that way. Um, so we're building what we aspire to, to be the world's first carbon negative meat company. Uh, and so in 2019, we made the world's first air-based meat. It was chicken, air chicken. Uh, and it's powered really by ingredients and specifically protein that requires no arable land and that can be made in a carbon negative way from cradle to gate. Uh, and so this is something that we're super excited by because it allows us to really usher in a new era of, of meat production. Whereas today to make a steak, it takes two years. And the, you know, you mentioned kind of deforestation being a key uh, issue when it comes to grazing and then also for that animal feed as well. So it takes two years and it, and, you know, leads to a lot of deforestation. Uh, and it has, you know, that greenhouse gas footprint, same as a car. Uh, whereas with our process, you know, it all starts with elements of the air and we're able to make a really nutritious protein ingredient in a matter of days using no arable land whatsoever. Uh, and so we can scale vertically, think of fermentation, think of making yogurt and making cheese, but we flip that process on its head. If you're making yogurt, you're using milk as your input. Um, you know, typical fermentation may use sugar as an input, which also requires land. Uh, and so our process, we get the elements directly. So CO2, oxygen, um, you know, we need a fixed nitrogen source and renewable power. And we use that to split water and create hydrogen, which is the energy source that drives uh, this process. And so in the end, what we end up is a novel way of in a carbon negative fashion, making a really nutritious protein. The protein ingredient that we're scaling up today has uh, a, a, an amino acid content that's about 80%. So it's really rich uh, in amino acids, complete protein, all the essential amino acids and the rest of the ingredient is bioavailable vitamins and minerals. So very nutritious outcome, output of this process. And we believe that it's the most sustainable way to make protein because it requires zero arable land and it is carbon negative. Uh, and that is something that leads to scalability. As we try, as we grow to 10 billion people by 2050, where are we gonna get all the land from really to continue with our current practices, continue with taking two years to make a steak and you know, contributing to the greenhouse gas emissions problem and clearing land for cattle grazing. Um, so in this case, you, know, you can scale vertically, you can deploy in any geography, a desert, rain or shine, day or night, you're continuously producing really nutritious ingredients. And so we're able to take these ingredients and make the world's first carbon negative meats, everything from the chicken where we started to air scallops, to air halibut and beyond. And so what I believe and what the company believes and, and many people actually in this new alternative uh, you know, meat and alternative protein industry believe that we, we want to, uh, we envision a world where we define meat as the experience that people have when they're biting into a juicy steak or a chicken breast. And it's not about the fact that it took two years to make that steak. It's not about the source, but it's about that experience. 
And so our goal, our mission is to create, recreate those experiences for people so that they will come back over and over again to enjoy a new way of producing and experiencing those same meat flavors. So that's what we're doing and building at Air Protein. Terrific, thank you. Um, so yeah, I, I would love to uh, to start by uh, talking a, a little bit more about the about the technology, um, and then we can kind of flow from there to uh, to impact and scaling. Um, so yeah, so you mentioned uh, hydrogen as the, that's the the sole energy input into your into your process for for producing these proteins. For the the culture, yeah, that's the sole energy input. Mm -hmm. Wow. Um, and so do you envision sort of, uh, or are you building fully integrated systems where you, where you will, you'll basically have your own dedicated renewable power source, electrolysis system, fermentation unit, and any sort of downstream or, or how do you, how do you envision this on sort of the pilot scale? And then, and then as you go beyond that to sort of commercial scale, is it going to be fully integrated or, or do you sort of um, basically take pieces from different sources? It, it will be integrated. Uh, and so what is something that we're following this macro trend that renewable power is becoming more and more abundant and lower and lower costs. And in fact, the lowest cost renewable po or power today is renewable. It's wind, wind energy. And so that's something that you know, we're leveraging and we will leverage as we grow. Uh, and so the, the renewable power is the key starting point. And as you said, it's like fossils where we split water. Uh, and then we feed that plus, you know, oxygen, carbon dioxide, uh, and a few other inputs into our air, air fermentation process. Uh, and then we end up with downstream, we end up with a finished flour, an air protein flour for that first step. But we actually, as a company, don't stop there. That's our unit of innovation. That's what makes us different and distinct is the fact that we can, we can grow protein in a matter of days using zero arable land but then we wanna make the products that people find delicious and want to eat. My husband being kind of the main customer for me, if he likes it, then I know we're good. He's from Turkey and they, they, there's meat in every, every dish. <laughs> His mom was convinced that she was gonna convince me to become a meat eater again. I just hadn't had the right preparation, but um, so yeah, so he's, he's my guide. And so we then take that, uh, that protein flour and we apply culinary techniques. Think of going from your wheat flour to pasta um, so we add pressure, temperatures, just culinary techniques to then get to uh, the, the textures that you're used to experiencing when you bite into, you know, a piece of animal-based meat. Yeah, and, and so the, um, so to, to get to where you are today, um, so the, these, these microbes, of, of course, are, are, are quite old, and, and the, uh, the idea of, of using them, you mentioned in the, on the, Air protein website. You know, NASA was was uh, exploring. I think they still are today exploring the use of some of these microbes to generate food on space missions. What would you say was the biggest technical hurdle you had to overcome to get to where you are right now in terms of, of getting this fermentation process to work um, as as efficiently as it as it needs to for for production. Yeah, absolutely. And just to just to highlight, double click on the, the origin story is that NASA and the space program, 60s and 70s, they were they had a question to answer, which was if we're going to send people, humans out to Mars or distant planets, how can we ensure that we're able to feed those people the whole time? And, you know, the steak example, it can't be two years and lots of land in order to do that. So they thought of different ways to grow food more efficiently. And one of the ways was to use these class of cultures uh, as a way of recycling the carbon uh, that the astronauts would breathe out into these nutrients that they then would eat. So creating closed loop carbon cycles essentially. And so that program ended, the space program ended and they, you know, by and large research on this stop. You know, of course there's always a few press professors here and there that work on things, um, but by and large that, that ended. And so myself and Dr. John Reed, a colleague that I knew from my, my graduate school days, uh, we decided to pick that up off the shelf and see if we can make different things, you know, other than what they were thinking about originally using this type of process. Uh, and so when we first started, we actually went to contract manufacturers and we said, hey, here's what we want to do. Here's the cultures, the, the microbes we want to use, and here's what we want to do. And what we, the hardest thing was that, you know, I'll just say no one knew how to work with hydrogen. <laughs> uh, and so it's, it's the ability to actually grow these uh, cultures in traditional 
uh, fermentation contract manufacturing facilities. That was the hardest thing. Uh, and so we had to build it in-house. That was a case where we didn't want to build it in-house, but we had to. And so we had to build the, the knowledge, the capabilities and know-how around how to use these different elements as an input into a, you know, a fermenter, how to retrofit that fermenter so that it would then be able to um, deal with these, these gases that have low solubility, for instance. Right. Um, so a lot of technical challenges along the way. And then we were able to kind of hit and solve many of those challenges and get really high productivities, 10x the productivities that NASA scientists were able to hit. And that's when we knew we were on something. Wow. So, so you had to become something of a chemical engineering company, I would imagine, uh, to, to solve that problem early on in terms of getting the gas delivery at the rates you need to, to sustain the, the right productivity. Yes, yeah, so it's definitely multidisciplinary. So it's not just your typical fermentation scientist. We had to get people that understand chemistry, the chemistry of hydrogen and gases and chemical engineering, as you mentioned. Uh, so we were able to build kind of that group of, of partners and um, you know people team that kind of brought those different skill sets together in order to solve the technical challenges that needed to be solved. And, and I wouldn't say that we're there. I'd say that, that we're going to keep, we're in the process of scaling. Happily, we've hit the technical metrics that we need that when, once we plug those into our techno-economic assessment, then it's a very attractive economics. And so we're scaling, but there's so many opportunities to continue to advance this technology to make different ingredients um, using different cultures and beyond. Yes, yeah, so it's interesting. You said, you, you know, hydrogen was sort of the challenge that people didn't know how to work with it. Um, a, a lot has happened in the hydrogen space over the past, you know, 10, 15 years, and it, it seems like there's, there's now sort of tremendous momentum for scaling hydrogen and bringing down the cost of, of electrolysis. Did you anticipate that? Um, so, so in other words, did you sort of focus on organisms that take hydrogen as the input as opposed to perhaps some other gas uh, energy source, thinking that that down the road, you know, looking at the trajectory of, of renewable electricity, that, that perhaps hydrogen was going to be the most, you know, readily accessible, simple fuel for these types of systems, or, or was that just a function of sort of the organism that you, that you chose to focus on early on? Well, first I'll say that if we could predict the future, that would be great. Um, <laughs> but uh, so, but we did believe that hydrogen, the hydrogen economy you know, we would want to be a part of building it because this type of technology uh, is a way of, of basically synthesizing long chain molecules well. And we started off looking at oils uh, and we were, you know, we demonstrated that we can make like a beef fat replacement as an example, a palm oil replacement. Uh, and that was Kiverti. And then when we decided to go into fuels, uh, not fuels, food, <laughs> we decided to go in food. We created a new company, Air Protein, really to focus on that, that problem and, and really start focusing on protein in particular. But it's more, it's around understanding that, you know, protein, oils, they're made out of hydrogen and carbon. These are the building blocks. And so if you had a, a process that can take these building blocks directly and synthesize them, biosynthesize them, as it were, then that would be a way to unlock the potential from a perspective of decreased land utilization right. from the perspective of using, you know, CO2 directly. Uh, and so that's what drove us. Yeah. And so, and so um, speaking about sort of Coverti and some of these early products in, um, you know, oils, palm oil, um, or I, I, I think I saw that uh, they make an aquaculture product as well. So what really drove the decision to, to focus on meat and to, and to create air protein as opposed to sort of focusing on some of these less complex products perhaps like an oil or or an ingredient or a feed um, that you know you don't have to give you, you don't have to market to a consumer ultimately um, and perhaps would be a little bit uh, at least from an outsider's perspective we are you know should be easier to to produce so w w why go all the way for the chicken or the scallop um, if you could make the animal feed or aquaculture feed, for example. So Coverti has a B2B business model. So Coverti is that, that ingredient that you don't know about. Uh, Coverti is making that and we're partners really with large corporations to help them solve their, their technical challenge with challenges with that with this technology. Uh, and so that is what Coverti does and Coverti's business model. Uh, what, what we decided is that there's an opportunity. The market is ripe. Consumers are voting with their dollars and they're looking for 
alternatives in the food area. Food wasn't a focus when, when we started from Erdi, but food became more of a focus of the world of many different organizations and governments, what have you, uh, over time. And we saw that there was an opportunity really to go directly to the consumer with our story, with our message. Okay. Okay. Uh, and so that's why, you know, we created Air, Air Protein as a separate company to really build that, that brand and that, that messaging, really just to say, hey, here's, here's a new way of of produ producing things. And here's, you, you know, you, when you buy this product, you're actually doing something better for the planet and here's why. And really be able to tell that, that story and catalyze the industry, catalyze others to um, know that carbon negative manufacturing is, is possible of, of everyday products. Yeah, I, I think that's, that's, that's a really important point that, that engaging the consumer and enabling them to make a choice um, so that they can decide uh, to what extent they're willing to to pay for a product that's more sustainably sourced. Yeah, I guess if you're if you're farther up the supply chain um, and you're replacing aquaculture, but but the consumer doesn't know it, right? They don't know with the fish they're eating what what it was fed. Uh, maybe a lot harder to to get traction there. So that, that yeah, and, and the more they know and the more they choose to buy those products, the more industry will change. Right. Right. Yeah. The more they'll, they'll be forced to to respond. Yeah. Absolutely. Um, so what, I, I don't know if you can comment on at what scale, um, you, you talked about the sort of techno-economic projections, w what is the scale of a commercial plant where um, that really starts to look favorable? In other words, like what, what's sort of a target scale for a first commercial plant or the nth plant, if, if, you, if you prefer, um, just to try to give us a sense of what what the footprint of these would would look like, and you know how much power perhaps would uh, would be needed to to produce the, the proteins, how much solar or wind we're talking for one of these plants. Have you have you sort of projected that far in, in thinking about what this looks like uh, into the future? So if you look at fermentation, of course, is as old as when we realized that beer and wine tastes taste good. Um, so if you look at a brewery, if you look at a fermentation facility, um, yogurt manufacturing. Uh, so, you know, if we, you know, we're looking at going up to say a hundred thousand liter plus scale. Uh, and then that would be able to allow us to make millions of pounds of meat, or I'm sorry, tens of millions of pounds of meat per year, 5 million pounds or so per year. And so that, that's, that's, I keep, I'm saying 550, there's another zero that I'm leaving off, 50 million pounds or so a year. Um, and so at those scales, you know, we're, we're both having an impact in terms of the actual uh, amount of, of products of meat that we're making. And, you know, our projections show that we're economically attractive and competitive um, with other products that are out there. Wow. Okay. And, and so, and, and those products would be in grocery stores or restaurants or both, or what would it What's the what's the target sort of entry markets for those? Wherever meat is found. Okay. Okay. <laughs> but, we, but we will launch, you know, in food service first. That's that's the plan. Um, really to to deliver to 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 be able to be a part of delivering the message and the uh, pairing the you know our food with other products and creating that experience. Because again, food is all about experiences, and so we want to recreate that experience that you you get today. Um, so food service will be where we start. And then as we grow and expand, then, then of course, retail is where everyone purchases their, their, their food. And are, are, there, are there regulatory hurdles to, uh, to rolling out in, in food service or, or, or beyond? And, and how significant are those if, if you're facing those? Yeah, what we, we've chosen to do is go through the FDA, um, you know, grass process generally regarded as safe. And so we're ticking the boxes and making our way through that now, uh, really to demonstrate the nutritional value of the ingredient that we're making. Uh, and so that's just a process that we're going through and, and happily we're uh, making great progress through that. Okay, okay, great. And um, so, so you would, your first plants would be in California uh, or, or where are you sort of thinking um, uh, regionally to, to roll this out? Yeah, two part answer is that we are building capacity here in California and that will facilitate our launch into the marketplace. Uh, and that will also be, you know, where our innovation happens as well, where we continue to innovate on new ingredients, uh, where we continue to innovate on new products going beyond our, our chicken and seafood offering to beef and pork uh, and beyond. And, um, but there's many other geographies that we're looking at to expand to that have, for instance, an abundance of, of wind energy. As an example, wind, of course, again, 
some of the lowest cost wind, energy that you can find now is wind energy, um, hydroelectric, and then increasingly solar. So there's there's many different places that we've we've been looking at as uh, potential expansion play, locations, and you know we've identified kind of our commercial expansion expansion location location now. Haven't made any announcements about that, okay. but we'll okay. actually make an announcement soon. Cool. Um, okay. But you're you're just uh, probably a few weeks early of the announcement. Okay. okay. <laughs> And uh, can you give us some insights so, uh, a little bit on the downstream? So, so you get to the the flower, the pro, the protein flower. Um, wh what? How, how much processing or or um, you know, what do you have to culinary work do you have to do to turn that into a piece of chicken? And how different is that process than making the scallop? It, it's sort of mind boggling, boggling to me how you start with the flower and you make something that. That looks like a piece of chicken or a piece of scalp, which have very different textures, very different uh, characteristics. So, so can you give us some more insight into to what that what that part of your technology looks like? Yeah, absolutely. And so that goes back to this cross functional approach to really understanding what what makes meat meat, what makes it have that structure. Some things might be more stringy, and some things you know might you know, there's sort of different properties. And our chicken platform actually leads nicely to our to pork. Um, the okay. way that we're making our chicken, you know, pork is kind of naturally a, a, a second product from that. And the way that we're making our scallops, we're doing it differently, you know, than, than something like a beef filet is a natural um, extension of that. And so we take we take technologies that are traditional that others are using. Think of extrusion, if you're familiar with that. Okay. Um, that's one that people are using today. But then we, we also, the whole, you know, our whole company and our whole business is around marrying industries that weren't normally married. In this case, having to understand mass transfer and gases and all that, which is typically not in the food industry, and the way that we're in integrating it into the food industry and the fermentation. And so similarly, we, we use different technologies and techniques to generate the, the textures for like our scallop, or whatever, so that we do use the traditional uh, te techniques, but we also are innovating and leveraging things that are not used in the food industry today to actually create the textures that you're looking for for the different meat products. Wow. Um, and if we sort of now shift to, um, you know, thinking about impact and, and uh, impact on uh, ecosystems and, and deforestation, um, what, what is the, what is the product that you, th that you think would have the biggest impact on, on deforestation? What are you going for to try to ultimately um, address that problem? Yeah, well, for, you know, soy is used in feed for many, if not most animals. So, you know, you listed that as the second biggest culprit. Um, and so that's something that we can address is the, the, the feed to these different animals. Um, so, but of course, beef is number one. Yeah. <laughs> beef is the biggest, biggest uh, culprit when it comes to, to climate change, climate impacts. So going after the beef products will, will help us um, get there even faster in terms of transitioning our food system to something that can be more carbon negative. And, and that, what sort of, um, what sort of hurdles beyond, uh, you know, what you've already addressed for chicken and for um, seafood, what are the additional hurdles for, for beef? Why not start at beef, I guess, is another way of asking. Well, one reason is that everyone else did. Okay. Okay. <laughs> so we're starting in a different area. And okay. one thing that we want to stand out with our brand and what we're doing is that we can actually look at the, the nutritional aspects as well. And we highlight that as being important. And so many people in the US and some other geographies are shifting from beef and pork to chicken for health reasons. And so we decided to go after one of the, you know, perceived to be healthiest meats out there and then to make it healthier, you know? And so we want to demonstrate that we can deliver the taste, the texture, of course, the sustainability that's just given, um, but also that we can deliver nutritional outcomes as well with our first products. And so that was one of the reasons why we chose chicken. And then the, the, uh, the seafood products, you know, again, another area where people aren't focused and where we can come and stand out, stand out, not just for the, you know, sustainability benefit, but that we can actually mimic a scallop or a halibut right. um, directly, whereas others haven't been able to do that. Okay. And th there's been some, uh, it seems like there's some pushback uh, in, the, in the industry, um, maybe from some of the incumbents saying that, okay, these, 
alternative meat products. And I realize there's a whole spectrum of them, some of them plant-based all the way to, to technologies like your own uh, are, are not healthier or, uh, you know, than, than traditional meat products, or in some cases, there's a notion that they're, they're less healthy because of additives. How do you, how do you address that? Um, and, and, and how do you respond to that? Yeah, we address it directly. Again, that was why one of the reasons we chose chicken so that we can create something that's, that's not only comparable to something that's already, you know, a healthier meat, as it were, but make it even healthier. So as we're making our protein ingredients, for instance, you know, all the essential amino acids, we start off with complete proteins. We start off with uh, protein ingredients that have bioavailable vitamins and minerals, bioavailable minerals as well. So we start off with a nutritious ingredient. And then as we're building that and converting that into applying the culinary techniques to get to a meat product, we add a minimal set of additional ingredients so that we have clean label, minimal ingredients, you know, low sodium, no cholesterol. We are targeting all those nutritional outcomes with the products that we're making. Perfect. Um, and it, it, how do you, um, I, I, I guess, how do you think about these perceptions of, you know, what's a, what's a good meat, you know, what's a healthy meat to eat versus, versus a, a, an, an unhealthy meat or, or what's a healthy food product? Is that, is that boiled down for you to, just to, you know, sort of managing the ingredients and, and, and getting that message out there to your consumers? Or, are, or do you think that there are some, um, some perceptions that may be hard to change um, that, that will take sort of different tactics over time to, to try to address? Yeah, so, so in terms of animal meat, you know, we, we leave the debate to the animal meat people about which is healthier and which isn't. Okay. We're trying to bring in the new generation, the next okay. generation of, of healthy meats. And so we're focused on bringing nutrition, no matter what the products are, uh, while bringing that flavor. So people are, are really looking for a certain flavor when they're, they're sitting down to, to have a specific piece of meat. We want to deliver that flavor, but, but we're, we're building it ourselves. So you have to remember, that's what's the difference. The difference is... The pig is the pig yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and you just eat the pig, but we can understand, well, what makes that pig taste like, what makes that bacon taste the way it, it really caused people, causes people to come back that craveability and then, you know, work with our food scientists to like deliver that and, and deliver it in a way where we're starting with just great ingredients. So, so our focus is to build the next generation. I, and I'll pause and say that my grandparents were farmers, my aunts and uncles were farmers. And so I come from a family of farmers. And as I was talking to my aunt the other day, you know, we see ourselves as just the next generation. We're continuing it, but we're doing it differently. And so air bacon should be good for you as well. Great. Yeah, I, from my perspective, it seems like, you, you know, recommendations about what is and isn't healthy to eat, they, they evolve over time, right? And, and the, the science of, of understanding the effects of different diets um, is, is not perfect and it takes a lot of data over many years. So I, I, I appreciate your perspective. That actually, you can respond as, as, as the science evolves and, and we learn more about what components of different foods are or aren't healthy. Um, as you said, the, the pig is the pig. There's not much you can do about that, but you're in a position to, to yeah. respond to that. So I think that's- Yeah, and if you look at how animals are farmed today, they, there's ways of doing it that maybe are even less healthy. So there's you know hormones, antibiotics. Yeah. So our process is hormone-free, antibiotic-free, herbicide-free, pesticide-free. So all those different things that people are concerned about as well, impacting you know, the quality of their food, we start off in a very different way. So there's a, a question from the audience uh, about uh, genetic engineering. So, so are, the, are the organisms that you're using ge genetically modified? They are not, they're non-GMO. Okay, okay. Uh, there's another area that from my perspective, it, it doesn't, uh, it wouldn't concern me at all, but obviously it's an area that, uh, that many consumers are, are concerned about, but that's good that you don't, you don't have to deal with that. And then the the final products that you that you're making. So the, the chicken, uh, it it's cooked presumably. It went, you know, in the the product that the consumer would buy, or does it need to be cooked, or or how does how does that work? 
Yeah, yeah, two part answer. One is, um, you know, we can deliver and we will deliver kind of, you know, the quote unquote raw version into the marketplace, primarily when we get to retail. Um, but also we can deliver kind of uh, signature dishes as well. So we work with chefs and we will continue to work with chefs to to create those experiences. That's that's the benefit of what we're doing is we're we're sitting down with consumers and we're understanding what they're looking for, what flavors they're looking for, what do they want paired with, with their food, what kind of spices do they want. And so we can deliver the raw products, but also the signature dishes as well. Okay. Um, so getting back to, to deforestation and sustainability, um, ultimately it seems like you would, uh, you need to have a, you know, lots of production in the developing world um, where, uh, uh, first of all, there's perhaps you know a greater stress on on agricultural lands, so there's there's uh, sort of a built-in demand for for new technologies, perhaps that can produce food more efficiently. But second of all, in in you know in countries where uh, where there is uh, you know massive deforestation, uh, what are your plans for sort of expanding uh, internationally? And how, how how do you see do you see any significant barriers to deploying this technology? Really, anywhere in the world where uh, where where it's needed. Yeah, we we definitely we're starting in the U.S. of course, um, but we already are talking to regulatory bodies because that's kind of the the key thing that will as we go into different geographies, we have to go and work with their different regulatory regimes, uh, and so that's we've already started some of those conversations, and we're doing our our, our grass process now in a way that trans transfers nicely to you know the places where we're we're, where we're in conversations with. With different people, and you know, this is a, a new way of farming, and so we hope to create this as a new way of farming for people in different countries across the world, and pe people in the U.S. as well. Uh, and so, a way of growing protein vertically, quickly, and efficiently, and creating products, creating meat from that—a new way of making of, of meat farm. So, not animal agriculture, but air protein agriculture. So um, one of your uh, investors uh, from the, your, your recent fundraise is, is ADM, one of, one of the giants in, in the agribusiness. Um, how, do you, uh, how do you envision sort of partnering with these large agribusiness companies? I mean, in, in, in some ways you're, you're a, a competitor, right? But, but what's sort of the strategy for in, in engaging them? Um, as, as you grow and, and hopefully, you know, reach capacities that, that they're used to operating on, on a, a daily basis. Yeah, one thing I'll say is that I'm a part of the Unreasonable Group, one of their fellows, the, and, and Air Protein is one of their companies, uh, their portfolio companies, and they have this, this, this value of we is greater than I. And we believe that working with Air, with uh, ADM is a force multiplier for us. They're one of the largest fermentation companies in the world. They're North America's largest protein provider. And they just recently announced their, their huge commitment in, in protein. You know, I think it was $300 million investment that they announced recently into a new protein innovation center. And so they're investing heavily, yeah. specifically in sustainability. They are a food company and they, they know and believe that we need to continue to accelerate sustainable food production and they're investing in it. And so that's one of the reasons they invested in us. And we are excited about that partnership. And because they're one of the largest fermentation companies in the world, we, we see that as de-risking you know, our scale up working with them and collaborating with them. So uh, it's, it's all positive. Okay, terrific. And, and so in ultimately, I guess you see the change that you're starting and, and the technology that you're proving sort of spreading to these bigger companies and then, you know, adopting this approach or some of their own sort of variant of this approach to, to produce food products. We believe and we want it to be the wave of the future because what else is there? Right. Uh, definitely there's a lot of people working. And, and so let me let me actually say that differently because we stand on the shoulders of giants and many, there are many people in this space that are working on alternative ways of making meat and making food that's that's much more sustainable. And so we're part of that community. Uh, and so, you know, we we want to catalyze more and more of that. And in particular, we want to catalyze the carbon negative, zero land version of that. Uh, and so we do see that, you know, we envision. 30, 40 years from now, as this, even before then, we envision air meat being just, oh, that's just meat, you know, um, but ultimately, you know, 20 plus years that this will be a, a normal way of manufacturing. 
And do you think that um, the 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 meat lovers today, perhaps your your husband among them, that that they will be receptive to uh, to just embracing this as meat, or is it really a matter of you know sort of the new generation, the younger generation, growing up eating products like this and not really even thinking twice about oh okay this is a meat substitute or this is an alternative meat versus versus a non alternative meat that is that change going to come from the the young generation you think or 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 do you believe that that you can you can really convince people who have grown up eating you know chicken and beef and pork that that this is every bit as as delicious and uh and something that they should you know that they would switch to on a on a normal basis yeah it's change change you know innovation leads to change constantly we see that in many industries and i don't think this is different what's what's going to happen so as, as i look at my definitely the younger generations they they're growing up understanding environmental impacts of, of food and meat in particular and flexitarian they're more likely to be a flexitarian you know potentially than older generations but as i you know my my 80 plus year old aunt and uncle grew up in louisiana there's there's meat and everything you know with my my mother's family and their their hometown cooking that when they became vegetarians i almost fell out of my chair and and what what you know you know to some degree some of people are you know shift because of health reasons in their case it was purely driven by health but that's what drove them to look at alternatives in the marketplace um so i think that's one side of it is that it isn't just the younger generations for various reasons, other segments um, are also looking at alternatives. But then on the other side of the equation, what I say is that what's important is that it tastes good. If it tastes good, if you can deliver that experience, if I can deliver it again to my husband, uh, then you know he's going to eat it and he's going to want it and crave it. We, we you know we want to make things that are craveable as well, uh, and that just are natural replacements to what you have, and you can you can eat it with. Uh, the knowing that you're actually doing something positive for the environment as well. So once this, the taste piece is unlocked, then, you know, I believe, we believe that that's how we get to the, the everyday meat eaters who aren't thinking about the environment. Right. They're just thinking about having a great experience when they sit down for dinner. And, and it's interesting you brought up uh, vegetarians. So I mean, do, do, you, do you see vegetarians as being drawn to this, to this product or, or something that, uh, it would take some warming up for them to to consider because they're not used to sort of eating meat on a regular basis anyway so um how, how do you think about that that market yeah so what i would say is that the role that we want to play so the biggest the biggest impact is to is to transition the meat eaters off of traditional sure. animal agriculture that's the biggest impact and that's the impact we want to have so when we're making our food we're looking to those that actually enjoy the flavor of meat and delivering what they're looking for. And so to the extent that there are vegetarians that, that also will enjoy that, maybe they're recent vegetarians or they've been missing yeah. that steak this whole time, then absolutely. Um, but that's really our target because that's really where the biggest impact can be felt. The vegetarians are already having their impact. Okay. Mm -hmm. okay. So I, I, I wanna spend some time, particularly since, um, you know, many of the people who, um, who uh, access the the Tomcat content are are students who are aspiring to be entrepreneurs themselves and and you know interested in applying their their skill in tackling these these huge problems. Can you can you give us a maybe a little bit more insight into what what drove you to go from being a a theoretical physicist to to now tackling this you know very practical problem that requires all you know this very interdisciplinary approach what what drove that that change uh in in you yeah so it really was driven by that that time in in new orleans after hurricane katrina and just really seeing that climate change is real um and and when when we do have increased uh not not to say specifically that that was caused by climate change but the frequency of weather events the intensity of weather events being increased really affects people's lives uh, and just really wanting to figure out how can I be a part of the solution as climate scientists are telling us that this is this is a problem what can we do um, what can I do so my background is is you know physics plus business so science and technology 
plus helping executives solve business problems. And then I'll add on top of that, that my dad was an entrepreneur. So he um, at some point was the president of a chain of 55 hair salons. So I, I just grew up seeing you know, someone who would have ideas and, and seeing the highs and lows of entrepreneurship and seeing him gather people to kind of execute against those ideas. And so having that, that background uh, plus business, plus technology, that's where I saw things coming together for my contribution. Policymakers have a role, regulatory bodies, NGOs, they all have a role in this. But where I saw I could fit, and my colleague, Dr. John Reed, where we saw we could fit together was to, to really focus on the technology, the science. What is the, what, where is the science sit? How can we turn that into a technical solution that we can commercialize? And how can we turn that into something that people will, will buy? People are buying things every day. So let's have them buy things that are better. Uh, and so that's really why we first, first build Converti, you know, targeting you know, different, with different targets, and then ultimately decided to add to our portfolio of, of companies as it were air protein to, to target the, the meat and, and food industry in particular. Yeah, so, so you know, one of the things I, I try to tell um, prospective grad students or incoming grad students that you know, the, what you learn in graduate school, you really learn how to how to learn, and they always look at me like um, I, I'm not making any sense. But but you're empowered, you know, going through graduate school, no matter what the, the specific discipline is, you you emerge sort of empowered to you know tackle hard complex problems. Um, and I, I I would I think you know you're perhaps the best example of this because your area of deep study in your, in your education, very, very different, obviously, from, um, my, you know, from fermentation processes. Was there any, and, and I, I know you had a, a co-founder with some expertise in this area, was there any sense of hesitation that, oh, okay, I'm getting into a technology space, you know, I've spent I've spent my education studying deep physics, but now I'm getting into a technology space that's that's totally different. Was there any sort of hesitation or, or did you really feel like, okay, all of your experiences had really equipped you to move rapidly in a, in a new space, a uh, space that's new to you and, and, and make progress? Yeah, I'd say no, no hesitation whatsoever. Um, I mean, for me, just, I was raised by an entrepreneur. So, <laughs> and, you know, he had ideas, my dad, and, and he would just go and go after them, you know, he'd get after it as it were. Uh, and you know, many other experiences that I had just really caused me to not put myself in a box and what, what could be done in a box. And so it was more that when I partnered with Dr. John Reed, we just, to your point about education, teaching you how to solve problems, that's, that's what it was. And it's more with my dad, it was teaching me to be bold and be courageous and not um, be constrained by what has, has always been done. Uh, and so we, we asked the question, how could we have an impact? And yes, it's a big ambition that we have. We, we, our, our mission is to accelerate the world's transition to climate and rainforest cleanly meat. That's our issue, our mission at Air Protein. And, and you know, in order to do that, our way of doing that is to, to, to create this carbon negative meat and scale it as fast and as much as we can uh, to accelerate that transition. Uh, and so I'd, I'd say that both my, uh, my dad's entrepreneurial background and me seeing that and, and being taught through all the many years I spent in school uh, how to solve problems made it just something that, you know, follow your passion. So it's something that I'm passionate about you know, my colleague, Dr. John Reed was passionate about. And then I'll, and, and not to just focus on the beginning because we then were surrounded by so many great people that joined us first as advisors. And then, you know, in our first, in our garage phase, we had people coming from their day jobs to the little lab that we rented in San Francisco at night uh, to help us figure out what we're, you know, what, what we could do with this. Can we actually turn this into a, a, a commercializable technology? Uh, and then we've just had so many people join us in this journey that have their own passions and their own uh, goals in life. And, and they see how this fits into what they're, yeah. the impact they're trying to have. So I think part of it too, is just seeing the momentum. We first entered a business plan competition and then we, we got a, you know, we were one of the, the winners we placed and we're like, oh, well, maybe we're on to something. So, and, and from that point forward, just so many people have been a part of this journey going to, you know, our investors and our, our current employees and our advisory groups and just so many supporters out there. So these are the, these are the things that make it uh, impossible to not do it really. Yeah. Uh, that's a, that's a terrific point about, 
advisors. I, I think there's a, I speak a little bit from my own experience, there's a sense when you're starting something new with a big, um, a big lofty goal that it, there's so much that, that needs to be done and you need so many people, you would need such a big team to solve all these complex problems, but you can, and, and you don't have the resources to, to of course hire that team on, on day one, um, but you can leverage um, experts and, and advisors is something we try to uh, encourage and facilitate at the Tomcat Center as well. You can leverage uh, people who are willing to put time in after work, right? And, or, or they, you know, they, they have 30 or 40 years of industry experience directly in an area that you need and, and they're inspired by, by your mission and can, uh, can really help you solve technical problems that would otherwise require a big, big team to solve. And I would say that that's been probably the biggest surprise for me. The biggest, the thing that I didn't expect was just how many people were out there that were just eager to help and eager to be a part of what we were doing. Uh, so I definitely encourage students, if you are, have an idea, uh, you know, leverage the, the network, you know, the, the, the alumni database, you know, contact people that are industry experts. And you know, there's many people that are just waiting to, to be put to use and to be helpful and to extend what they're passionate about and, and help someone else uh, do what they're passionate about. That's terrific. Um, so uh, just in the last couple of minutes that we have here, it, returning to, to NASA as it were, or to, to space exploration, um, what do you think about the, the prospects of, of, you know, utilizing these systems. I mean, certainly at a high level, you, you have to do the types of functions that, that your technology does in order to you know, produce food on a deep space mission or, or perhaps at a, in a Mars settlement. I understand, as I understand, there's sort of two camps. There's one is that, okay, we just need to increase launch weight and then we can pack everything that we need on these, on these trips. And the other is that, okay, we, we do have to build the capacity to, to make things, um, away from earth what what are some of the hurdles or what do you think what would you think what the timeline would be for really bringing this type of technology to to deep space either on a on a, a space shuttle or on a settlement on, on mars yeah i mean one would want to continue to innovate to just make things as efficient as possible you have so little space um, yeah. available and then of course you know, when the, the other factors are different, um, gra the gravitational, you know, field, whatever force, um, you know, gravity is different in those locations. And when you're flying there, you know, if you want to eat while you're on your mission to Mars, yeah. as it were, you know, so there's, there's other things to, to address. So, you know, the, the scientists at NASA got us to the moon with uh, technology that is so ancient compared to what's on my iPhone. <laughs> Yeah. So we can do it. The, the amazing thing about humans is that we can kind of solve many of these challenges that, that, that we may face. And the core, this core science, you know, we, we've worked on the core science and gotten it to a point where it's economically attractive, or at least it, it appears to be. We're scaling now to demonstrate that, uh, at, you know, with what we're doing here on Earth. But I think it's just a matter of doing more research and getting it ready for, for space missions. And is that something that, that you think would be a, a something that Air Protein would would participate in in the future, or or is there another frontier I should say for for the, uh, for this company that uh, that would leverage some of these innovations to to tackle another problem? Yeah, no, I'd say that we I mean we're 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 we want to be a part of feeding people wherever they are. Of course, okay. here on Spaceship Earth, we have a huge need, and our spaceship yeah. is going to have ten billion people by twenty fifty. So we have a need to figure this out here, and that is our our current focus. But in the process. You know, we're, we're happy to be a part of all kinds of scientific explorations. We, Coverti has been benefited from, you know, grants and being a part of governmental projects across the board from a number of different industry, uh, governmental bodies uh, in different countries as well. And so we would happily continue to work with the government uh, and, and actually now it's not the government anymore. It's, it's all these other organizations yeah. that are focused on space travel. Um, so yeah, happily we, 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 we work with any of them to bring this to fruition for long journeys. Um, well, you, you, you've given a lot of advice all, already, but I, I guess I'll give you one, you know, one more opportunity. Is, is there anything else you would say to the sort of uh, aspiring entrepreneurs that maybe the undergraduates or the science and engineering students in terms of, you know, how they, 
uh, how they pick a problem to go after and, and, and how, how they carve out a path uh, to, to doing that? Yeah, I'd say for, for myself, um, it was, it was a, a, a bit of a journey. It was a bit of a, a discovery process. And, and what catalyzed what ultimately became Coverti and then what led to the creation of Air Protein was, was business plan, was a single business plan competition that led to multiple business plan competitions. And so the, the nice thing about that is that it forces you to actually sit down and, and create the full story and see how, if it holds water. And then tell other people about it and see what they think, does it hold water? And then if it does, get other people that are interested, you know, with these business plan competitions, often they'll have, they'll have advisors that have signed up to help support students and other participants. So, so for, for us, that definitely was a catalyst for us to just press go. Yeah. And, and that first plan that you put together, it, is that, um, it, it basically, has that been the, the sort of the core of Coverti and, and Air Protein, or has it evolved a lot since that, that first time you forced yourself to, to sit down and, and put it together on paper? Yes, absolutely. It's exactly as planned. <laughs> this goes back to predicting the future again. <laughs> yeah. No, no, no. Of course, you know, as they say, you're, once you write it all down, it changes the next day or what have you. And that's okay. true. I mean, as an entrepreneur, you're going to have to pivot. You're going to face okay. reality and reality is going to tell you, oh, it's slightly different than what you expected. Uh, and, and, and the reality is we started Converti in the middle of a recession. Uh, yeah. So that that impacted things, and when the price of oil was dropping, and all kind of things were happening, so um, so you have to pivot, and and you if you stick with it, and if you yeah if you stick with it, then then you'll see what amazing things can result. Well, uh, this has been uh, really enjoyable, and I think uh, just tremendously uh, inspirational uh, and, and informative. So so I, I, I want to thank you, Lisa, for for taking the time to talk with us. Um, but before I, um, but before we go, uh, I, I want to emphasize for for everyone uh, watching it live or who will who will access this um, later, uh, we have a Tomcat Center community, a, a networking hub uh, through LinkedIn. Uh, that link, Donica has posted that uh, in the chat. That's a great way to uh, to connect with each other. Um, if you are interested in connecting with uh, Air Protein. Um, please uh, re reach out to us at the Tomcat Center and, and we can help uh, facilitate those, uh, those connections. Um, uh, you know, anyone who's interested either in, in trying to help or, or, or learning more or perhaps um, just buying some, some chicken and, and scallops. And, and, but, um, We're hiring. So, oh, oh, and you're hiring, <laughs> yeah. fantastic. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, so, so please, uh, please connect through, through LinkedIn. Um, or uh, or reach out to us and, and, and we will put you uh, we will put you in touch with, uh, with the folks at Air Protein. Uh, Lisa, thanks so much uh, for for taking the time to talk with us today, and it's just really been a, a tremendous hour to, to spend with you. Thank you so much for having me. I've enjoyed it. <laughs>